Elise Brodreux is MCF Agiaire at Université Polytechnique Hauts de France. She has published a book on the poetry of D.H. Lawrence, Le Jeu et ses masques, Septembre 2014, and various articles on modernist poetry. She is co editor of No Dialect, Please, You're a Poet, Routledge 2019, and the editor of L'Air du Temps de 1922, Royaume Uni et Etats Unis au rythme d'une année, au rythme d'une année, 2022. For a few years, she has been working on the representation of the experience of hospitalization in British contemporary poetry. She has published several articles and defended an HDR on that topic. So, it is kind of ready where all is. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'd like to thank you all for being here. Without you, it would be different. Um, and for inviting me to talk uh, to you about matters that are apparently quite deterring, but believe me, they're, they're not completely deterring. So I have decided to broach the issue of intersection by bringing together poetry and hospital and see how they work together and if they can. And more precisely, look at a selection of poems that depict or evoke scenes in the surgery room. We will hence read poems that cut layers of skin and flesh. For a couple of years, as Nina said, I've been working on the representation of the experience of hospital uh, and of hospitalization by British poets from the second half of the 20th century, so basically um, uh, when uh, the NHS was created, uh, till now. And the corpus turns out to be quite substantial, in fact. Reading these poems together, poems written by various poets, men, women, young, old, healthy, sick, etc. So reading all these poets uh, together helps us grasp the complexity of the experience of hospitalization. If hospitalization is prompted by a physical or a psychological symptom that one addresses to a health professional, it is not reduced, as we all know, to a physical or a psychological experience. Hospitalization is a social experience with one's identity transiently at bay or even sometimes shattered. It is an odd phenomenological experience during which the patient sees, hears, smells, but at the same time is the central focus of a clinical vision. It is the pro he is the primary substance that's repeatedly touched, etc. Hospitalization is also an ontological experience experience where the illusion of one's identity is of oh, sorry where the illusion of one's eternity is cancelled or at least suspended in hospital one becomes conscious of one's own finitude various poets have hence managed to seize this complex uh, these complex emotions at the heart of hospitalization when the individual is vulnerable and because of this vulnerability, their subjectivity is remarkably intensified. Now, before broaching the issue of the surgery room and of surgery poems, I want to stop briefly on the status of our modern hospital, which is fundamentally, as we know, different from what it used to be. Uh, Gunther Ries, in Mending Bodies, um, Saving Souls, A History of Hospitals, schematizes the evolution of the status and missions of hospitals since their origins. I've got... Yeah. So... Originally, the hospital was a house of mercy, basically a refuge. Uh, it was also a house of segregation where potentially threatening individuals were isolated. By the time of the Renaissance, it became a house of rehabilitation. By the 18th century, as state power was focused on uh, economic science and health, the hospital became a house of cure and also gradually a house of teaching and research. Um, a few decades later, further me medicalization transformed the hospital into a house of surgery. Then, new advances in medical knowledge and technology in the early 20th century witnessed the emergence of the hospital as a house of science. And nowadays, I'm quoting, um, well, um, uh, the hospital has become a house of high technology, <laughs> providing mostly intensive care.
So the poems um, I'll be looking at depict this modern hospital from the house uh, of surgery and more precisely step into the surgery room. That unique place where the patient comes alone, that is, without their family, without their friends, where the bed becomes the table, where the persisting hand of the surgeon is operating with specific tools and techniques and with the help of increasing performing technology. As we will see, the poems show how the operating theater is a sanctuary in the hospital, the room where so much is at stake, the patient's future condition, the patient's life sometimes, and the surgeon's professional and personal status and balance. What I want to point out is how poetry, by its economy of form, its conciseness, its accurate selection of words and their controlled organization on the page, turns out to be an appropriate form to express the more or less intense tension that hangs in the surgery room. Nothing is performed at random, neither in a surgery room nor in a poem. Textual and physical cutting, extraction, amputation, stitching are ultra-controlled, ritualized and repeated. Poems and surgical act intersect here, around precise ritualization, repetitions of the same, same gestures, same words, same sounds. And, what, and once the art has been performed, once the flesh and text and the text have been stitched back together, both the surgeons and the poem, poet hold their breath and wait for the outcome, the result, the effect produced by their respective fine operation. This tension specific to the surgery room, hence, and that's what I will try to demonstrate, finds a fitting form of expression in poetry. I will divide my speech into three parts. First, looking at three poems in which the surgery theatre is a stage for intense, peculiar, dramatic performances. Then I will look at a very graphic poem by Robin Robertson about heart surgery that highlights the necessary objectification of the body. And I will conclude with Hannah Sullivan's poeticized C-section. So here is uh, my first part. The surgery theater, a stage for dramatic performances and suspension of disbelief. I want to start with a poem whose poetic value is to my mind quite relative but which will lead us into the place we'll further explore with other poems. So in 2014 Hugo Williams, a British poem, poet, published a collection of uh, poems entitled uh, in the uh, From the Dialysis Ward in which he relates his own weekly perambulation to and in St. Pancras's hospital for his dialysis. Five years later, in 2019, he publishes Lines Off, another uh, collection, uh, in which he broaches, among other things, um, his experience uh, of his kidney transplant. His poem, entitled Transplant 2014, which I'm going to show, reveals nothing about his physical experience, neither does it describe the modern surgery room. Instead, Williams' personal experience prompts his mind back in time, transplants his approach to the surgery <laughs> of the 19th century. I'm going to read the, the whole poem so that it's easier uh, to follow uh, my analysis then. Transplant 2014. I thought of the old operating theater of Borough High Street, a marvel of the age in 1821 where students and doctors enjoyed a state-of-the-art technology. You enter via the spiral staircase of the Southwood Cathedral Chapter House and the antique smell of a herb loft looking down from the gods on a wooden O where the ghosts of doctors and patients rehearse their mortal pantomime. The operating table takes center stage with its headrest and manacles, its mop standing in a bucket, its blood-stained aprons hanging on a hook behind the door. 
The vertiginous tiers of seating have rails for the students to lean over, drinking and shouting, to drown the screams of the principal as he struggles to free himself from the terrible demands of his part. He is giving the performance of a lifetime. So the introductory, I thought, signals the transfer back in time to another surgery theatre in which the modern patient pictures himself as the principal, the principal helpless actor lying upon the centre staged table. This transplantation back in time takes the poet and the reader to a place at once secluded and known by many people today, visitors, um, uh, tourists can visit uh, that place. It is a place which is at once shielded from the world, cut out from the sound and the fury, and in central London. It is at, one c it is at once common in collective imagination and unique, a marvel of the age. The operating theatre, not just the old operating theatre, but the o operating theatre is indeed a unique uh, place uh, in so far as what is performed in it cannot be performed anywhere else. If medicine, care, treatment, forms of cure can be provided in any hospital room, hospital corridors sometimes, in the waiting room even, or at home, what, take what takes place in the operating room is specific to that place. Therefore, the mere mention of old operating theatre line one triggers precise images in the reader's mind. The first stanza describes a space whose verticality magnifies the flimsy frontier between life and death. <coughs> The patient's soul will be able to rise. Doctors and patients, quote, rehearse their mortal pantomime at the end of the stanza, which hence prepares the reader for the sacrificial show of the second stanza as a deliberate and ostentatious performance. The operating table is the focus of all the attention of student spectators who behave like crowds attending Shakespeare's plays at the Globe and an obvious echo, uh, as an obvious echo is made with the wooden O in the first stanza, the circularity. The performance is strikingly visual with manacles, hook, blood and it is acoustic. The audience's reaction competes with the screams of the principal actor whose existence is believed to be at stake. The excess of Hugo Williams' description here may well be read as the expression of his intimate apprehension to go through kidney transplant, but it is also partly realistic if we believe um, the testimonies and paintings of the 19th century. This is a picture of um, the old operating theatre as, as it is today, and as it was, but it is a contemporary picture. In the 19th century, surgery was a performance in both meanings of the word, as the persisting phrase surgery theatre signals. But if so, and this is what William's poem indirectly tackles. The issue of the suspension of disbelief needs to be addressed. A dramatic performance relies on the tacit convention that the audience suspends their disbelief. On stage, blood and death are true only in the mind of the spectators who deliberately decide to believe they are true. A surgical performance, on the other hand, even in a surgical theatre, is truth. Relying on their similar architecture and resembling organisations, Hugo Williams introduces dramatic convention and aesthetics in the surgery room and hence indirectly evokes the possible artificiality of the bloody show in which he is about to perform in transplanting himself, that is, a 21st century patient, into the part of this anonymous 19th century principle, isn't he pretending that everything, including fear, is mere pretense? Isn't he creating the right conditions where he can only pretend to believe in this horrifying show? Or isn't he saying, after all, let me pretend 
that this is just a scary show. <coughs> so this poem, Transplant 2014, can be read uh, side by side with one of Julia Darling's poems entitled Operating Theatre, posthumously published in 2015, but written uh, at the, in, around 2005. Julia Darling was a poet from Newcastle who poeticized her, her experience of cancer uh, and hospitali uh, hospitalization, combining a vertiginous realism with lighter irony and even humor sometimes. In her poem, Operating Theatre, whose title once again seeks to make explicit the connection between dramatic and surgical performance, Darling addresses the frontier between truth and performance, and tr performance as truth. Here is the poem. This is the full poem. But they're always dying on the stage, having bits sliced off, eyes gouged. While in hospital, they try to keep real death shushed behind floral screens. Though they tell me in the operating theatre, it's quite beautiful the way our bodies open out like flowers, the colours of veins and intricacies of organs, tissues, bone. Yet the surgeons have no language for this beauty, no time to write it. But they would love to, make, to take a bow when the curtains are drawn back. The pronoun they at the beginning split into two categories of performers. The actors in the first couplet that ostentatiously pretend to be dying and rise to their feet after the curtain has fallen. And the health professionals who keep real death hidden behind hospital curtains. But in the operating theater, in this space where only a happy few are allowed, a selected crowd of actors who are at the same time spectators. There, surgeons have access to a unique show. There, surgeons see what can normally not be seen, that is, the inside of the patient. But this repeated uh, action, our bodies, um, line six shows that it is part of their routine. But in this repeated, beautiful and intricate vision, um, but sorry, but this vision is never aestheticized beyond its being paratactically per listed as organ, tissues, bone. The simile, like flowers, the way our bodies open like flowers, the simile is cut short by the surgeon's failure to extend it beyond the sanctuary of the operating theater. In this poem, at least, the surgeon's art or talent is not speech, but gesture. Their temporality is not that of actors as well. And yet, the last couplet imparts they may be willing to be applauded after their repeated performances. By bringing together two types of performance, uh, Darling suggests that while the actor pretends to slice bodies and hence imitate the surgeon's gestures, but not the intention, of course, <laughs> the surgeon does not pretend, but yet wishes he could imitate the actor with a final bow. Both Hugo Williams and Julia Darling's poems rely on the confusion and separation between real death and fake death. But we may consider, uh, we may wonder, sorry, what about the status of real or really anesthetized patients in a surgery theater? Isn't it a case of fake death? The patient etherized upon a table is lying immobile not responding to anything, not dreaming for not even sleeping. Surgery hence relies on this transient, artificial, apparent death, a role the patient has, in most cases, agreed to perform. And this performance actually defines that of the surgeon. Both roles work together. Marie-Christine Pouchel, a French anthropologist who's been working on, on the, the, the question of hospital for years, highlights the symbolic significance of the coexistence of the active surgeon with the artificially inert patient. 
And this is a quote. Nous avons vu que nous pouvons nous interroger sur la disjonction du corps et de la conscience produite par l'anesthésie dans la personne de l'opéré. Il, a, il apparaît que le chirurgien, qui se trouve en revanche en état d'éveil maximal, fait aussi l'objet d'une disjonction symétrique. En effet, il est bien là, aux yeux de tous, planté sur ses deux pieds, ou en appui sur une jambe, voire à demi installé sur un tabouret. Mais ses mains, ses doigts, les instruments qui en sont le prolongement, ses yeux, sous, sous son attention, enfin l'ont simultanément projeté dans un autre espace mental et sensitif que celui de la salle d'opération. Dans un espace ordinairement inaccessible à l'œil, dans un univers de taille réduite, certes, mais auquel les affleurements vitaux donnent un poids concret et symbolique considérable. Pouchel here points out what is involved in the surgeon's task. The intensity related to their, having, to their having access to the normally unseen and the effect that each gesture will produce somehow transform their inscription in the here and now. Though physically here and now their relation to space and most importantly too to time is significantly complexified. Not unlike an actor performing on a stage in fact. This temporal disjunction <coughs> is, to my mind, what Danny Apsi evokes in his poem in the theater, a poem written in the 80s. Um, though in this poem, the patient is, unfortunately for him, not completely anesthetized. So Danny Apsi was a Welsh poet who died in 2014, but he was also a doctor, he was a chest radiologist who drew acute poetic uh, inspiration from uh, his experience in the medical field, like in the poem I'm going to read. So this is the, the opening, the, the epigraph, if you like. So the subtitle, so in the theatre, the subtitle is a true incident, a sort of of parenthetical confession that immediately clashes with the theatre announced in the title. It is followed by a quote by Wilfred Apsey, the poet's brother, who was also a doctor. Uh, so, so this is a quote taken from a letter. Only a local anaesthetic was given because of the blood pressure problem. The patient thus was fully awake throughout the operation. But in those days, in 1938, in Cardiff, when I was Lambert Roger's dresser, they could not locate a brain tumor with precision. Too much normal brain tissue was destroyed as the surgeon searched for it before he felt the resistance of it, all somewhat hit and miss. One operation I shall never forget. So this epigraph works as stage directions. The, uh, the upcoming scene will stage a surgeon trying with his fingers to locate a tumor. This epigraph, especially the end, um, reads as a traumatic trace left by an intense experience fundamentally characterized, as we'll see, by a sense of urgency. Danny Apsi handles that crisis from the fluctuating perspective of staff and patient, but he constrains it within four irregularly rhyming septets. This formal, disciplined stages, staging opens with the comforting voice of a nurse addressing the patient. So this is the, the first stanza. Sister saying, soon you'll be back in the ward. Sister thinking, only two more on the list. The patient saying, thank you, I feel fine. Small voices, small lies, nothing untold, though soon he would blink again and again because of the fingers of Lambert Rogers, rash as a blind man's inside his soft brain. The first, uh, on the first line, soon you'll be back in the ward inscribes surgery in subjective temporality. Soon, vague and unaccountable, is merely designed to reassure the patient about the certain certainty of his future. One of these line four small lines, lies, patients are told, set phrases like cues learnt by heart. But immediately after line two, we have access to what the nurses meanwhile thinking, only two more on the list. 
by which she underlines her legitimate obsession with a rational ordering time of schedules, and in which one already hears the echo of tumor in tumor. Yet soon, line five, soon reappears too soon in the poem and sets the patient not in the ward as promised he would soon be, line one, but still partly etherized upon a table in the theatre with Lambert Roger's fingers inside his soft brain. An image that almost naturalistically translates the surgeon's rising panic. This odd use of soon signals that the nurse has not been able to keep a promise for the cadence of the surgery has not worked out as initially intended. That performance, unlike a well-timed theatrical performance, involves the possible eruption of peripetia, which have not been written in advance. Objective time is reintroduced in the next stanza as the nurse keeps an eye on the clock. If items of horror can make a man laugh, then laugh at this. One hour later, the growth still undiscovered, ticking its own wild time. More brain mashed because of the brobe's braille path, Lambert Roger's desperate fingering still, his dresser thinking, Christ, two more on the list, a cisternal puncture and a neural cyst. The clock here competes with the tumors own biological wild time, whose tempo is heightened by the succession of three stressed monosyllabic words, own, wi own wild time. Each unit, like each minute, counts. Wild suggests that all is ironically ruled by the unruly cadence of the tumour. But again, it is the audit time of the schedule that worries the dresser who thinks, Christ, two more on the list, a cisternal puncture and a neural cyst, which ironically resounds almost like a nursery rhyme. Since its first occurrence, the list mentioned hasn't moved on and tumor, tumor relentlessly resonates like tumor. The schedule is stuck. The poem here, lends voice to the patient, whose temporality is still other. Then suddenly, the cracked record in the brain, a ventriloquist voice that cried, you sod, leave my soul alone, leave my soul alone. The patient's dumb lips moving to that refrain, the patient's eyes too wide and shocked, Lambert Rogers drawing out the probe with the nurses, students, sister, petrified. Leave my soul alone, leave my soul alone. That voice so arctic and that cry so odd had nowhere else to go till the anti-gramophone wound down and words began to blur and slow. Leave my soul alone to seize at last when something other died. And silence matched the silence and the snow. The etherized cue or refrain from an actor that should logically have remained silence, silent, leaves the staff in a state of shock, and thus hanging petrified at the end of the third stanza, they will not reappear in the final stanza. Surgical time has been certainly frozen. The patient's stammer translates his panic, as well as the disordered temporality, till it turns into a material mechanical almost appeal. In the end, biological time rules, leave my soul alone, reproduces the final blur of a gramophone being turned down, signals at once the final extinction of the patient's time and shows the fragmentary destruction of language. In this peculiar context of a theater that is cut from objective time, of the, from the objective time of the outside, where the time of the schedule is stuck to two more on the list, and the time of surgery is petrified, the patient's individual time is slowing down and eventually interrupted. The only temporal instance that seems to have been unleashed is the time of the tumor, until 
its eventual rupture. In that type of theatre, then, the main actors must cope with the eruption of the unknown. But here the surgeon fails to improvise a response to this wild crisis, and he petrifies. The French psychiatrist Pierre Lévis-Soussan remarks that in the operation room, when the, when the patient's life is at stake, stress contaminates the whole space and the surgeon's psychic life is at stake. And the petrification of the Staphinapsis poem imparts this form of vi vi vicarious trauma. So, th though different in nature and value, these three poems by Hugo William, Darling and Apsi um, all address the spatial and temporal specificities of the surgery theatre and its relation to immediate truth. Discontinuous from the surrounding world, like the world on stage, with actors clad in hospital costumes, with little lies now and then spoken, the surgery theatre yet cannot be closer to truth and reality. In this theatre, existence is fully embraced, and only existence, real life, matters. So basically, surgery does not share anything with drama beyond the setting, neither in terms of intention nor in th their relation to the real. And yet we've seen words like theatre, performance, encourage us to look at it, to look at them side by side and to sometimes build, build too easy similes and metaphors that stubbornly lead us to find echoes. Among these echoes, <coughs> I want to look at it. One whose relation to truth is, even for the surgery room, not that obvious. I'm talking about the principle of ritualization. Both surgeons and actors rehearse and prepare their props. Pearl Katz, an American anthropologist, published a long time ago in uh, 1981 an article uh, entitled Ritual in the Operating Room, uh, still meaningful today, in which over 16 pages she describes each detail of the unfailing rituals followed by the staff before starting the surgery. <coughs> Katz primarily insists on the nature of rituals in general. In any social group, rituals rely on separation. For instance, children from adults, women from men, married from non-married, the living from the dead, etc. And there are rites of passage that make each individual move from one group to another. So this is, with these examples, she insists on the idea of separation in ritualization. In the surgery room, the primary ritual is to separate the pure from the impure. Scrubbing rituals seek to clean off all the bacteria and germs that may cause serious nosocomial contamination. The sterile and the non-sterile are segregating, segregated. Touching is highly controlled. Tying a gown is thought through and supervised, and each contact is scrupulously prepared. These hygienic protocols, doctors argue, almost become also become habits and sometimes superstitions. Some surgeons have expressed reluctance to change in this. Uh, um, to sorry, they, they have expressed re reluctance to any change in the scrubbing protocol, fearing that it might bring them bad luck and alter the performance like actors before a play. This more or less failing rationality in this extremely rational scientific context reveals the symbolical or mystical or even sacred dimension of ritualization in the surgery theater. In order to be able to cope with the eruption of the unknown, as poeticized uh, by Danny Apsi, surgeons and staff want to control whatever can be controlled. Katz argues that even jokes, a peculiar form of comic relief, are ritualized in the surgery uh, room. She writes, this is an example, I could have picked many other uh, passages of her long article, but this is uh, just one. As the technical tasks become routinized during the first stage of the operation, 
joking begins. Most of the joking at this stage revolves around the operative procedures which are to be carried out during the next stage. I can't wait to get my hands on your gallbladder, Mr. Smith. Okay, sports fan, we're going to have some action. The first stage of the operation ends when the first incision has been completed and the organs are exposed. The joking abruptly ends just as the second stage of the operation is about to begin. Of course, only surgeons and um, so only surgeons can start making jokes. Another type of ritual that ensures uh, the hierarchical organization. For the surgeon stands on top with the anesthetist. Both have in common that what they perform is absolutely transgressive. I should probably have started with that. The surgery theatre is unique, not just because it is ex excessively ritualized, not because it is cut from the world and objective time. It is unique primarily because it is the only place in our Western society where one individual is legally allowed to cut the flesh of another individual who has been drugged by still a third individual. There, in the surgery room, making incisions through the layers of someone's skin, opening a body of, of someone who is alive, intruding their orifices, are authorized transgressive acts. But this violation is justified by its necessity and its intention, by the fact that it is highly ethically controlled and submits to a strict deontological code. The surgeon standing above a totally naked body, he or she is about to literally open, is protected by this code from feelings of guilt and shame. If slaying a body on stage having bits sliced off, eyes gosh, to quote uh, Julia Darling. So if slaying a body of, uh, on stage is a mere imitation of real violence. In the surgery room, an amputation is real, yet it is not violent. So in both theatres, violence is unreal, but the processes of derealization fundamentally diverge. Before a play, one suspends, one suspends one's disbelief so as to believe in the truth of the slaying. We'll see that in the surgery room, the surgeon suspends his belief in the subjectivity of the body lying down and chooses to believe that in this room it is an object that hence can be incised. The spectator of drama deliberately believes, while the surgeon, at once actor and spectator, deliberately disbelieves. With that in mind, we will read The Harving, a poem by the Scottish poet Robin Robertson, which sheds light on the details of this authorised transgression. Robertson, with his fine use of words, brings the reader's gaze very close to the opened chest. So, suspension of disbelief, necessary objectification of the patient's body. I'm quoting Emily Dickinson's quatrain uh, um, as an epigraph um, to, to this second part. Surgeons must be very careful when they take the knife. Underneath their fine incision stirs the culprit life. Dickinson's mind here works as a poet's and not as surgeons. In this quatrain, the incised body remains a subject and the cutting is the illegal transgression of a culprit. Surgeons follow Dickinson's recommendation, but their, careful may, their carefulness is made possible precisely by forgetting that life lies, un uh, sorry, by forgetting that life lies under their knife. In order to open a human being, the surgeon needs to refi the body and hence to refuse to believe that he is cutting a living body. Michel Cayol, who is a surgeon, testifies that this ethical objectification of the body is, I'm quoting him, a necessary abstraction. That is, the surgeon must be aware that his or her deliberate suspension of belief is a necessary fiction. 
and it is transient. The body is necessarily refied, but only during surgery. In the having, the poem I'm going to read, published in 2013, Robin Robertson relates a personal experience of heart surgery. In his poem, he offers an objective gaze on his own operated body, and in the first stanza, he renders this, he renders this deliberate reification. I, I, can you see? Yeah, is that fine? General anesthesia, a medium sternotomy, achieved by sternal saw, the ribs held aghast by retractor, the tubes and cannula drawing the blood to the reservoir and its bubbler, the struggling aorta, cross clamped the heart chilled and stopped and left to dry the incompetent bicuspid valve excised the new one a carbon coated disc housed expensively in a cage of tantalum is broken from its sterile pouch then heavily implanted into the native heart bolstered seated with sutures the aorta freed, the heart restarted, the blood allowed back after its time brought circulate abroad circulating in the machine. The rib spread a relaxed, the plumbing removed, the breast bone lashed with sternal wires, the incision closed. <coughs> the powerful effect of this first stanza derives primarily from the priority given to organs and objects. The surgeon and the staff are not visible. Their hands are only metonymically present in the effect of their successive actions. And we see it by the abundance of passive verb forms. As for the patient, he is anesthetized, only synecdochically present with references to his organs. This synecdoche is the poetic transcription of what Stefan Hirschauer in the, in the Manufacture of Bodies in Surgery calls, quote, the visual disfigurement of the body's gestalt produced by marked off sections and alienating covers intended to ensure sterility. So hence covered and unveiled in parts, the patient is anonymized. Robertson's poetic voice here, in fact, retrospectively reconstructs the details of a scene in which he was both the central material and from which he was subjectively totally absent. The organs are significantly not predetermined determined by my, but the, the ribs, the blood, the aorta, the heart, the valve. Thus spread out throughout several lines. They are exposed to the reader's eye, just as they are to the surgeon's skillful medical and technical gaze. The enjambment in the first few lines, where each line steps over the next, metapoetically evokes the transgression about to be carried out through the opening of the sternum. The instruments then multiply and seem to exceed in number the living body of the table, on the table, starting with the sternal saw, which in the syntax appears as the exclusive actor of sternotomy, a medium sternotomy achieved by sternal saw. No surgeon hand seems to guide it. The poetic context naturally magnifies each signifier and as such saw strikes the reader as at once banal, familiar, and dehumanizingly violent. This bone cutter is then used along a retractor to keep the ribs apart, and then with tubes, reservoir, disc, pouch, and wires. All these technical devices, daily employed to fix pipes at home, are here used to fix the heart. The fixing is carried out in a heightened poetic cadence that reflects the surgical tempo, especially when the heart is chilled and each gesture is ordered and each second counts. The replacement of the sonorous, incompetent bicuspid valve, incompetent, alluding to a deliberate failure almost, so the replacement of this valve by a carbon-coated disc that re-establish almost the heartbeat with a regular iambic trimeter, slowly moves the body towards a transhuman condition. 
The non-human device then is heavily implanted into the native heart, bolstered, seated, sutured. The heavy of heavily, the heavy determination to fix the device into the organ is hammered, hammered down by the alliterative S as though poetry itself were making sure to contain it. Now that the job has been down, done, sorry, life can start again. The aorta freed, the heart restarted. The causality of the silent comma tacitly brings order back an order metapoetically supported by the trochaic pentameter. The next line reverses the beat into an iambic rhythm, the blood allowed back, a reversal that prompts the return to normality, to the enclosure or closure of the sternum. The tools and instruments are one by one withdrawn, blood circulates, the ribs meet again, end quote, the incision is closed, like the stanza itself. The reader at that point is allowed some breathing space before the next stanza. So in this first long stanza, the subjective absence leads the patient poet to consider his own organs with the same objectifying vision deliberately adopt adopted by the heart surgeon. The poetic voice objectivizes and with the enjambment transgresses. The extreme focus on clear-cut details about dysfunctioning organs and technical devices defamiliarizes the body, makes this fleshy and real matter objects to the uh, uh, this flesh matter objects to the reader's eyes. To cope with the close focus contact with the widened ribs, the heart, aorta and blood, the reader is encouraged to graphically apprehend it as a patched up of as patched up objectified elements juxtaposed on the play on the page. The second and shorter stanza of the poem relaxes back into subjectivity. The patient wakes up from an anesthesia and the I and my then emerge in the poem. Four hours I'd been away, out of my body, made to die then jot back to the world. The distraction, the distractions of delirium came and went and then as the morphine drained, I was left with split chest that ground and grated on itself. Over the pain, a blackness rose and swelled. Pump head is what some call it, debris from the bypass machine migrating to the brain, but it felt more interesting than that. Halved and unhelmed, I had been away. I said to the ceiling, and now I am not myself. This shift to post-surgery subjectivity, though quite painful, shows the transience of objectification. Though the poem ends with, now I am not myself, the I still is. Though the patient is now literally partly objectified with a non-human carbon-coated disc in his chest, he is still re-subjectivized. <coughs> in this poem, Robertson brings the reader's eye and ear close to the signifiers, deliberately too close. He makes us see and hear the flesh and beat of words like median, sternotomy, on bicuspid valve, these medical words are extracted from their usual context, reified on the surface of a poem. Not unlike the body, they are parceled, exposed, for a while suspended on the surface of the text. This excessive focus on, on signifiers, combined with a paratactic, dehumanizing viewpoint, is a poetic rendering of the necessary, dispassionate posture of the surgeon. A reader and surgeon then emotionally cope with what lay before them on their table only because everything has been organized for them to see only mater immediate materiality. So we've seen so far how the surgery room is based on various types of ruptures from the outside world, from the rest of the hospital, from the others, the patient's family, from outside, outside time, from our normal relation to the real and to truth. In this sanctuary, sanctuary, 
Like in a poem whose words can be artificially and transiently split between signifier and signified, patients are artificially and transiently split between body and being. As a last example, I want to propose a reading from um, a long poem by Hannah Sullivan published in 2018 uh, entitled The Sandpit After Rain um, because I think the way that she poeticizes her C-section offers still another example of objectification of the patient by herself. So part three, C-section in the sandpit after rain. <coughs> the Sunpit After Rain is a 24-page long uh, poem in which Sullivan evokes the death of her father in a hospital where she gave birth six months later. She has that, um, that line at some point in her poem, birth and death happen on adjacent wards. So that's the, 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 the central focus, if you like, of her poem, this parallel between death and, and birth. I will here look at birth only, uh, at how Sullivan, as she necessarily reconstructs the crisis, evokes the surgery room. The pre-op preparation reveals her readiness to play the role of the patient. I lowered myself in my blue gown. I submitted to being shaved. So clad in the usual patient costume, she willfully submits to the ritualized protocol, to the dislodgement of her full person, an intentional desubjectivization that protects her from, feeling, from feelings of shame, maybe. A few lines down, she has arrived in the surgery room. While Hugo William, the first uh, poet uh, we read, so while he, Williams moved back in time, she mentally moves away elsewhere, at first ruling out any sense of major crisis. So, surgery, but it was not an emergency. It was not even like cancer. It was more like adenoids. The surgeon seemed too young, the anesthetist had something of the hockey team about her. There was a canula and they poked my legs. It was as if I had been planning to fly to Greece, but ended up on a coach listening to the toilet slurry with only a third of a book left and a flat warm bottle of San Pellegrino. We read here the expression of a sort of reassurance about the plot as she tries to equate it with trivial pathology. Then disappointment with the setting, which is not as glamorous as uh, she had expected. And limited trust in the main actors into whose hands she's about to deliver her body and her baby. Soon after, tension rises, a mixture of physical unease and intense fear. Let us jump forward in time and look at the moment of birth by C-section. Once they began, I was calmer. I enjoyed the gush of the knife and the sound of the scissors, the slop of my bowel being set to one side, the look on the surgeon's face, his attentiveness and shock. Can someone pass me the forceps, please? And then, almost too soon, he was looking away at the ascension of the enormous baby boy rising over the curtain into the knee and ceiling. Lying on the table, she is at once spectator of the show and she is the stage. Her body is the main plot. With the lower part of her body anesthetized, she feels distant from her reified inert body. This defamiliarization gives way to the unexpected pleasure she has hearing the sound of the scissors cutting her womb a sound conveyed in a partly anapistic rhythm coupled with the alliterative SZ, altogether increasing poetic satisfaction. She, she has no visual access at all to the central action, but only to the surgeon's face, which, because it does see the action and knows how to read it, is like a surface meaningfully reflecting the situation. Shock. She can then hear the surgeon's cues, the first one who announces the imminence of birth with forceps, 
that stands out as the only word bearing information and re reintroducing the cold materiality already present with the scissors. The second cue announces the birth of, quote, an enormous baby boy, a somewhat banal set phrase in these circumstances. It nonetheless bears a substantial performative dimension, anesthetized, feeling neither her womb nor her legs. It is the hearing of the announcement of the birth by the surgeon that makes it real, that makes it flesh and bone. The baby is then howled out and the new mother remarks, I have never heard a person so incredulous with rage. The first tie between mother and baby then is formed by the sense of hearing, by the unprecedented experience. The complication of the C-section then further magnify this hearing experience. And then they couldn't stop the bleeding. Everything was larger than they thought, they said. The baby, the placenta, the vessels, even the womb. So I lay on the table, hammer hammeraging? Hammeraging. hammeraging. And the alarm bell rang and the consultant asked, what uterine, tonic, tonics, yeah. what uterine tonics have been administered? Ocetocin, ergometrine. It sounded like a restaurant kitchen. Someone was washing up the fish knives and my husband had a face in his hands. Still feeling nothing, she decodes the critical situation by listening to the words of doc the words doctor address to each other. They said. She lies there, outside their conversation, a helpless ear witness, and ironically active only in the irrepressible hemorrhaging. And the alarm bell rang, and the consultant asked. The proximity of too stressed end, the absence of punctuation, and the repetition of identical schemes in the same line, the same beat pattern, and the alarm bell rang, and the consultant asked. So all this convey the rush forward. One sound, the alarm bell, prompted a medical reaction, the consultant's question. The reply appeases the poetic rush. Ocytocin, ergometrine, gives resounding prominence to the signifiers, leaving the obscure signified to doctors. The internally rhyming trochaic tetrameter moves into a transient respite evoked by the three dots, which may mark either confident silence, hesitation, or the patient's deliberately not registering what the sounds she hears. Her senses are then awakened again by, quote, uh, sorry, they're awakened again by, by what sounded like a restaurant kitchen. The table on which she is lying is now perceived as a well-set restaurant table with a womb for a dish. The gap between the odd comparison coldly expressed by the poetic voice and on the other hand, the image of the profoundly tormented husband, the true spectator, reveals her own distance from the immediate situation. Part of her senses anesthetized, with only hearing and limited vision left, the patient listens, objectivizes her body and the whole situation. This passage poeticizes the vertiginous intensity of the crisis felt by someone helplessly immobilized on a table, in the hands of the same of so, sorry, in the hands of some unknown people who are cutting a womb. Like Robertson at the end of the having, she at some point, uh, it was in the previous slides, no. yeah, uh, she at some point mentions the ceiling. While in Hugo Williams' poem, the 19th century old operating theater was vertically built to let God in and let the soul rise in case of death, in our modern hospital, patients look at the ceiling. That secular, horizontal plane that blocks the way, that condemns the patient to the here and now, that limits the space of the surgery theater to immediate material reality. The ceiling embodies the blunt limit between 
down and above, between life and death, cutting short all possible idea of a continuum. So to conclude, the analysis of a succession of poems set in a surgery room is like the analysis of different medical cases. Each patient has their own pathologies, each surgery is unique, even though the surgeon's gestures have been learned, practiced, rehearsed, and ritualized, for each body and physical condition is unique. So looking at various poems on the same theme does not lead us to any clear conclusion about what could be labeled surgery poetry. But thus set side by side, these poems raise questions, show how they touch what can't be objectively what can be more, sorry, what couldn't be more objectively real, like a failing heart or a bleeding womb. And yet, poeticization and dramatization are both at once, that rely in a process of derealization, act as a detour, for they in fact ensure the reader's more intense reconnection with the real, with life in its most biological expression. I haven't talked about an essential aspect that must be addressed here. If drama stages heroes, if lyrical poetry glorifies the exceptionality of a unique eye, hospital surgery stages the most common existences. To use Julia Darling poem, uh, yes, it's here, with our body. To use Julia Darling's words, it's our bodies that are lying on the table. And poetry, as it makes these so usual and repeated situations fit into aesthetic forms, turns the common into the possibility of an intense crisis in the dramatic sense of the word crisis, that is a possible reversal or turning point of the fortunes of the main protagonist, which we all are. Thank you. <laughs>